Did I say it right? Tana. Tana. And uh, I've given you the throne. I was born in Longview, Washington. Um, my dad's name is Tom, and my mom's name is Helen. Um, my dad was a Marine, and he served in Vietnam. Um, he was a, a sergeant in the in Vietnam. Um, let's see, he got wounded by a sniper. Um, he got shot three times. He got shot in the leg, the left leg. He got shot in the back that um, they could never remove the bullet. It still was in his back when he died. Um, he got shot through the hip and it went out the other hip. Um, but he lived. He, um, he had to have his leg um, amputated, the left leg from the knee down. So he was like that when he met my mom. Um, she was really young. She already had a kid. Um, my bro my half brother, I guess he was like four at the time. Um, she was a drug addict um, from a very young age. Um, and they used to fight all the time. She like abandoned me when I was six months old. So he took care of me. You know, that was my everything, was my dad. Um, he never got counseling or anything from what he went through in the war. So he was an alcoholic and um, he smoked a lot of weed, and um, he took a lot of pain pills, um, which he overdosed on it, you know, quite a few times, so he stopped taking those. That's when he started smoking weed and, and drinking. He would have, um, I remember when I was little, I just, I knew that he loved me. He loved me um, more than anybody could, like unconditional love, you know, that was my dad, that was my world. But he was really scary too. Because he would, he would get really drunk, and he would be really violent towards his friends, or he would black out or have flashbacks, you know, like twice or three times a week. So I just learned to adapt to whatever kind of mood he's in. Is it, come here, honey, give me a hug, or go hide in a corner because I don't know what he's going to do. You know, and that's just how I grew up. And when I was seven, he let, he let my mom um, take me to Montana to give her a chance to raise me you know, give her a chance to be a mom. And she ended up abandoning me again um, in this house in Poplar, Montana. And it was like two months before my dad found out that she had left. So the neighbor was this, um, it was like a medicine man, like a white man on this Indian reservation came over. And I remember this very well um, and took me to live with him until, you know, he could find my dad. And my dad came and found me, he brought me back to Oregon and, um, Life went on from there. Um, let's see. And then when I was 11, he gave my mom another chance to um, be a mom. And so he took, um, I moved back up to Washington with her. And he had I'd taken everything that I had since I was a little girl. You know, everything. And it was a lot. It was like a room full of stuff. I moved in with her in Washington. I thought this is going to be great, you know, I'm going to be with my mom, I'm going to come up, go to school here, I'm, I'm, um, you know, I want to be with my mom, I want my mom at this point, I'm an 11 year old girl, I want, you know, I want to be with my mom. Well, she wouldn't come out of her room, and I didn't think anything of it, you know, I'm just watching TV, it's summertime, I'm waiting for school to start, and she's always in her room, she would come out every once in a while to check on me, and be like all sweaty, you know, I'm like, what are you doing in there, but finally, I um, asked her, I found out what she was doing. She was smoking crack. She was addicted to crack, and her husband was addicted to crack, and that's what they were doing all the time. And then she got me high. I was 11 years old. I started smoking crack with my mom. And um, I don't, I remember it, but it was all happened in like a three month period. Like a lot of stuff happened. Um, there was these Mexicans that they lived down the road. They were drug dealers, and there was like you know four or five of them. She would like um, sell me for trade sex for drugs. 
to them. Um, she would make me go down there and have sex with them, come back and give her the drugs. This happened like three or four times a week. Um, by this time, I mean, I have an 11 year old daughter and I just couldn't imagine anybody touching her. You know, she's so tiny. And I got really addicted. I remember that, um, I remember that we had to move out of this place and the sheriff was gonna come and, you know, kick us out. So I was like watching all these tweakers um, coming in, into our place and uh, taking all my stuff. They're just carrying it out. All my stuff that I had since I was a child. Um, but I didn't, I, I didn't care. I snuck out the back door, went with her friends. They um, took me to a hotel room and shot me up with cocaine. And I remember I couldn't move. And I just remember hot tears rolling down my face. And I'm laying on a bed. And it was a couple. Um, I don't remember their names, but I remember looking over at her. He was on the bed with me, and I looked over at the lady, and she was naked, and um, she was trying to hit, you know, hit a vein, and she was just bloody from head to toe because she couldn't. She's obviously been doing it a really long time, and um, I don't even remember what happened after that or how long I was there. Um, I ended up being in Portland with them. They took me to Portland to a hotel. And the um, goal was they were going to take me to Canada or something to prostitute me out. And, um, but I ended up being dropped off at a boyfriend's house back in Longview that I had. And then from there, I just remember running the streets in my pajamas until I finally found my mom at this other dealer's house. And then I woke up the next morning and my dad was there. And my dad, my, I remember my mom telling my dad, or telling my dad, Tom, don't kill him. Just take Tiana and go. And I was like, and I, we just left. I, she, she goes, you're never going to see these girls again. All these girls had all my things, all my clothes. And um, she just threw them in garbage bags and handed them to me. And that was it. And um, so we came back to Salem. You know, my dad knew what happened, but he didn't want to talk about it. And I didn't talk to anybody about it. I didn't even tell him my dad that until like a few years before he died um, what happened and her and I never talked about it again um, so by this like a couple years go by things are okay I'm, in, I'm going to break high school um, but the damage has already been done you know I should have got some counseling you know but I didn't know that from that point on that I was going to be a drug addict you know it was already it was already in me. And when I was, I was 14, and I met Jade's, my son's dad, his, um, Alex, and I think he was like 20, and I was 14. And I ended up getting pregnant with Jade. Um, my dad wasn't very happy, but we made it work. I had Jade when I was 15. And then I started using and drinking a lot. Um, I started using meth. And I started drinking. Actually, I would do anything I could get my hands on. Anything. And any time. I was like, I didn't even care. But my dad, we lived out on um, South River Road, on Homestead Road. For like 20 years, he lived out there. Um, things are really hard. Raising a baby when you're so young. Um, I dropped out of school. I got my GED when I was 15. But, you know... All my friends were having fun. They were going to dances. They were graduating from high school. You know, and I'm at home with this baby. And it, I got really depressed. But I snapped out of it, I guess. Um, after that, I just went through, like, d different boyfriends. Um, just kept using. All I remember is just just using. I, I've been clean for almost two years now, and I still, like, get fragmented fragments of my memory back every day you know it really is like a fog you know um so I'm sorry if I'm like all over the place um let's see I start I got my first job at the barbecue pit when I was 18 um then I really started drinking heavily because my dad was watching Jade as soon as I get off work I would go to the bar actually I was 21 I would go to the bar and um I met Layla's dad. I have a seven-year-old daughter named Layla. 
Um, then I met my girls' dad that I have right now, but when I was pregnant with Layla, I was addicted to, uh, my, um, Alex, okay, hold on. When I was, when I got pregnant with Layla, I was smoking crack during the whole pregnancy. Um, I hit up, I was like in a room, um, I lived upstairs at the girls' dad's house, and I never left. I never went to the doctor. Um, my, um, I didn't eat anything but oatmeal and sunflower seeds and smoke crack. Um, I would eat and I would go throw up and smoke more crack through the whole pregnancy. It was really, really horrible. And um, the girls' dad, he was the one that kept giving it to me, you know. And he's sober. And it was like a way for him to, I'm not trying to put blame on anybody, but this is just how it was. It's like he used it, he knew it was a way to keep me there, pregnant or not, not even his kid who I'm pregnant with. Well, I, when the water broke, I guess it was dripping down my legs for a couple of weeks, and I just finally couldn't handle it anymore, and my dad came and took me and I, to the hospital where I delivered Layla. Um, I was so out of it when I had her. I didn't even want to hold her. Um, I couldn't even walk to like go see her because if you have a nat you know I had her naturally and as soon as I got there she came out like in 20 minutes I mean she just came right out and they knew that she you know was addicted to something when I had her um she was definitely one of the fussiest babies there obviously for the reason she was addicted to crack when she was born um, I couldn't even go walk down the hall to go hold her. I'd have, I couldn't even get out of bed. Um, the cops came to the hospital and said that uh, DHS came and said that they're going to take her, right? And they did. And I ended up getting clean. I got her back in three months, but I was drinking. And they didn't really UA you, like DHS didn't you like have UAs like they do now back then, like 17 years ago. It was all, you could drink one night and then go take a UA and you're good, you know? So, and I never really knew until the last couple of years that alcohol was considered a drug. So I thought, hey, I'm clean, but I'm drunk. But, <clears throat> so I got her back and this time I still had Jade with me. He's still with me this whole time. And I got Layla back when she was three months old. And then I had her back for only a couple months. And I had her and Jade and Bob in the car. And I was drunk. And I hit a parked car on the wrong side of the road um, and totaled it like at two in the morning because we were leaving from my dad's house. And um, nobody, Bob was, nobody was really hurt. Everybody had their seatbelts on. But I got arrested, got charged with a DUI. And I didn't tell DHS that that had happened, you know, because I still had an open case. I just got, you know, got her back. And um, they found out, they called me and said, if you don't bring your kids here, we're going to come get them. So I had to drop Jade and Layla off at DHS and say goodbye, right? Mm -hmm. So I went home. I took them there, and Jade's like, Jade's like nine at the time, and he's been through so much, but... Um, I dropped them off, I went back home. I threw all my baby stuff in Jade's room, the bassinet, the friggin' playpen, threw it all in the room and shut the door. So there's like no sign of kids or babies around me, you know? And I managed to stay, I was still clean, but I was still drinking. I think that I got, the night that I got the DUI, I called the girls' dad. Um, and I went to his house and I relapsed on, co on cocaine again. And I stayed up all night smoking crack. And then that next day, um, I went back home to my apartment and I managed to stay clean after that and not long enough to get the kids back. So I got them both back again. And <coughs> as soon as my case was closed, I was back to smoking crack. Um, I was addicted to crack for like, like six six years straight is all I did. Um, it was just smoked crack, and the girls' dad just kept giving it to me nonstop, nonstop supply of crack, cocaine, 
right? And I was drinking, and um, I never had to leave the house because he would bring me everything that I needed so I didn't have to go in public, you know, so he could keep me there. Um, and then eventually, he used to beat me up really bad, and Jade would um, crawl out his window, and he would go call the cops. And there's, the cops must have came like 20, at least 20 times, and I would... Um, I would go to the door and I would pretend everything was okay and they would go away. Every single time, he never got in trouble for it because I wanted to smoke him a crack, right? So I didn't want the cops to take him. That's how addicted I was. I didn't care how bad he beat me up or what was going on. Um, well, things got really, really bad. Oh no, they said that he couldn't be around Layla. I don't remember what happened, but DHS got involved again because Jade started taking pot to school. Okay, Jade started rebelling. He's in middle school. He's rebelling because Larry's beating me up. Um, and I'm, he knows, by this time, he knows that I'm high. He's, 11, he's like 10, 11 years old. He knows. And, you know, he probably knew before that, too. You know? But he's rebelling now. He's um, taking off at night. He's running away. And, um, and he's taking pot to school. And then the principal will bring him home and saying that he had brought pot to school and that he's suspended. And then the principal saw me with bruises all, all, all over my arms and, um, and my neck. And that's when DHS got called on me. And that's when they said that Larry couldn't be around Layla or Jade. So um, he took me to the store. Of course, I didn't you know, make him stay away. So they caught him at my house when I was with Layla and um, they took her. I had to call Layla's dad at this time, and and I, he took her. He, he uh, DHS gave um, Layla's dad custody, and I never got it back that time. Um, I haven't seen her in nine years. I haven't even talked to her in nine years. Um, I just had to let it go. I know that she is. Um, I know her dad's a good guy, and I've seen pictures of them on Facebook. And he's married and has two other kids. And she's 17 now, so I figure if she's 18, she wants to come talk to me, she can. You know? Um, well, well, after that happened, I, I didn't know it at the time, but I was pregnant with Dominique, my 11-year-old. So they took my kids, they put Jade in like OYA by now. He's just like off the chain, rebelling just being really bad. I couldn't control him. He's on probation. He's on parole. He's 11 years old. And, um, and I'm trying to fix me. I knew I was pregnant um, with Dominique, and I didn't want to lose this baby. I didn't want to lose Layla. So I stopped smoking crack. I stopped drinking. I started going to NA meetings. Um, I've never been to an NA meeting before. So this is 11 years ago. Um, so I didn't have a car anymore. Um, Jade was, Jade, um, Layla's gone. Jade was, um, he was in um, something called Christian Community Placement Center. It was a it's a really good program. Um, they put him in there. He's like got foster um, parents that are really cool, and we're like, you know, we're interacting, and he's doing really well. He's getting good grades, and the the, um, the plan was for him to return home to me. So, and I'm pregnant with Dominique, and I have an open DHS case, and they know that I'm pregnant, and I managed to stay clean, and I'm coming to any meetings. Um, I really didn't really get the whole thing. I was just coming to the, going to the meetings to get um, my slip signed so I could take it to court and show the judge, look, I'm going to meetings. You know, but I wasn't really understanding anything that anybody was saying. When I look back on it now, I, I went to like 100 meetings and I can't think of one thing I got out of it then, you know, um, because I guess I wasn't ready. But I had Dominique, I managed to stay clean um, for, what is it? One, two, three, like four years. I had Dominique, and um, I didn't really drink that much. Um, my case was closed after I had Dominique, and then like two years later, I had another daughter named Ruby. So I have two daughters, and um, I'm staying off drugs. I'm still drinking, you know, now and then. Jade's returned to the home. But then my drinking got heavy again. Um, I started going out, and I didn't know that, you know, that if you drink, that it, eventually it's going to lead to using. And it did. 
One night I got really drunk and I didn't want to be drunk anymore. I wanted to be high. So I went and got high. You know, when I look back on that now, you know, I just wish I would have knew now what I, you know, or knew then what I knew now. But, but nothing really came of that. Um, I just used like isolated, like using every once in a while. Um, I don't know. Oh, okay. I lived in the same house on Bruin Road for nine years. And then um, everything was going really well, and I, I found out that I had to move. So I moved to an apartment. It was like a three-bedroom house. I lived there for nine years. It was a nice place. You know, we had a pool in the backyard, and things were going really well. The girls were so cute, and, you know, I was finally being the mom that I was supposed to be, you know? So I decided, well, I'm just going to try a little bit of meth so I could pack up all my stuff so I could move. Just a little bit, just to help me move. Well, I never stopped. Um, I started snorting meth and I started smoking it. And then I started drinking every day. And then I started smoking crack again. So I was doing all three of them. By the time I was moved into my apartment, um, I think like four or five months went by before I was really, really bad addicted to um, crack again. Um, bad. I think I weighed like Jade and, and his girlfriend and myself, we weighed, we weighed, I got on the scale and I weighed like 110 pounds and they were like, damn mom, that's bad. And I'm like, yeah, I know. That's really bad. Don't smoke crack. Just I'm kidding. So <laughs> I'm kidding. It's horrible. It's fucking funny though. <laughs> it was really, really bad. And I knew something bad was going to happen. I could feel it. You know, it happened before. It's going to happen again. I mean, I always just, I would put on a lot of makeup. I would put on a good front. It would take me hours. Just, I'd have to get up hours ahead of the girls before they, when they, they started school. That's when it really got um, to the point. It was hard to keep up appearances. I knew I had to pick them up from school and I knew I had to look normal. You know, I knew I had to interact with teachers. I had the preschool um, Head Start program come into my house and, you know, but I, I, I pulled it off, you know, for a little while. I pulled it off. Um, then my dad died. I, my dad's been a part of my life this whole time. And he was always like, baby girl, can't you just stop fucking using? Come on, you're better than this. And I would say, yes, dad. I went to deep, I forgot to say, I went, through, I went to detox a whole bunch of times. I mean, but I, I think I stayed two nights. Um, one, the longest time I ever stayed was two nights. And my dad had a case of beer waiting for me when I got out. You know, because he didn't think drug was an alcohol, or alcohol wasn't a drug either. So, of course, I drank beer. Then I started probably using that night. I don't remember. And then the next time I went to detox, I left. I don't remember what they gave me, but I left. And I left a trail of needles from the car all the way to the bathroom. Um, I don't even know how I even got there. But I found out the next morning. Um, now I forgot what I was saying. Oh, the, my dad died, yes. My dad died. And I was not in a good... I was in a terrible place in my head and in my life for my dad to die. I was with him that day. We went up to um, the veterans hospital because he was really sick. I mean, he was a really hard worker. Even though he had one leg, he went and um, bailed hay um, for 20 years after that, after that <coughs> shot. I mean, he was a hard working man. I mean, he could outwork most dudes that he knew, you know? And um, I respected him for that. And um, when we got back from Portland, he dropped me off at my apartment and then the next day I got a call from the chaplain telling me they found my dad in his car. So he'd stayed out in his car. He might have had a stroke in his car and was out in his car all night in the middle of winter. And um, I think, I don't know if it was that night or the next day I went to Rite Aid about some syringes and started slamming meth. And from there, I didn't look back. Um, everything fell apart from there. Um, Let's see, I was on Browning, my dad died. I started slamming meth and I was, then I got really addicted to pills to bring their dad, the girl's dad was like, here, start taking these pills, it'll make you calm from the meth that he's giving me also. 
Um, and he just always had an endless supply of everything. And so now I was addicted to pills and meth, and I was drinking. So I did all three all the time. Slam meth, take a bunch of pills, and then drink a bunch of liquor. That's what I did until I couldn't do it anymore. And then I'm, it just, it was really hard. I mean, I was so sick and, and tired and, and I had Jade, you know, telling me about Larry. And then I had Larry telling me about Jade and I had to make peace with all of them all the time. And I'm trying to be a mom still. I'm still taking really good care of the girls, even though I'm high. I mean, I'm giving, I'm putting every ounce. I thought I was going to die. I really did. I was putting every ounce of energy just to take care of them. And I really thought that I wasn't going to make it. And Dominique remembers me telling her, if I, telling her if I die, these songs that I want her to remember me by. She even brought that up to me the other day. Mm. And I remember being in the room telling her that. And I didn't know if she would remember that because she was so young. But she did. Um, well, their dad and I got in a really big fight. And I had taken some Xanax, like a whole bar or something of Xanax. And I, the girls were sleeping in their room. Um, and I decided to go cook something in the kitchen. And I was, gonna cook, I was cooking noodles. And apparently, I was so out of it, I was trying to cook noodles. I went to the bathroom. I had a whole bunch of syringes everywhere because I, I couldn't hit a vein for nothing now. I didn't, you know, it was really, really bad. And I never did. I was trying to wake up because I was so out of it. Then I guess I went and passed out on the bed in the bedroom and I shut the door. Shut the door, I went and passed out in the bedroom. Well, next thing I know, somebody's beating down my door. It was the fire department. Um, I guess, I mean, the kitchen didn't catch on fire, but the whole apartment was um, full of smoke. And the neighbors had called the fire department. So I grabbed the girls, I let, I let them in. They're just getting ready to bust down the door. I let them in, and then the girls and I, we went outside to the front of the apartment complex. And um, I remember this cop asking me, do you have diabetes? <laughs> I'm like, can you explain to me why you have um, these needles? And then I'm like, yes, I, I do. I have diabetes. <laughs> and he's like, what type do you have? And I'm like, I don't fucking know. And he's like, well, the cops are testing, um, <laughs> the cops are testing, um, you know, the syringes. They found some bloody syringes in the bathroom. And it came back positive for meth. So he was a really nice guy, though. I mean, the cop was really nice to me. Um, they sat in my apartment with me for like three hours um, trying to get a hold of DHS to come take the girls, to um, bring them to Bob's house. Um, they were going to let the girls go to Bob's house because, um, you know, he's like family and he's clean, he's sober, and they know him. Um, <clears throat> so they went to Sublimity with Bob and they. DHS came, talked to me, and was like, we're not going to take your kids. We just want you to be on a UA hotline, and here's your color. It's going to be yellow. And um, so I was like, shit, okay, I just got to get some clean pee. Clean pee so I can go take UAs for DHS. Because at this point, I'm so addicted to everything, I didn't think I was going to be able to stop. So I thought, you know, clean pee will just get them off my, you know, off my back. So... I did manage to give a clean UA, but it wasn't my pee. And then after that, I just quit calling the hotline. Um, they said I could see the girls <clears throat> and go to Bob. I, I can go to Bob's and see the girls, but I couldn't be alone with the girls, and the girls couldn't come and stay the night at my apartment. And this is only a couple of weeks. I, this is before I knew it was going to happen to me. I didn't. This is before um, I was introduced to drug court. So I went to court. And then they're like, well, you need to go to drug court, this and this date, and observe drug court. And I was like, okay. And I was reading all this paperwork, and I'm like, holy shit, how am I ever going to, I'm not going to be able to use anymore. How is this, I'm not going to be able to use. I'm like, what am I going to do? Like, I really felt like a hole inside me. Like, I was like dead. I'm like, I can't feel anything. I have no feelings. I was just like, I might as well just die if I can't fucking use drugs. Seriously. And, um... So I went to drug court, and uh, it was a mess. I was high <clears throat> and, drug, and drunk, and um, they you weighed me at drug court while I was pending, and you normally don't do that that often. But I told them I was clean, and I wasn't. I came back for, like, cocaine, meth, 
<clears throat> pain pills, alcohol, and marijuana. You know, you but they, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they let me go, and that's all I could think about. I was like, please just let me go, so I go get high one more time. Please just let me go, so I can go get high one more time. That's the only thing that was going through my head, literally. And they did, but eventually it was really hard. Um, I never went to any meetings. Every time I went back to drug court, every Friday, uh, he's like, "Did you go to meetings?" I'm like, "Nope." And he's like, "I don't, I don't know why they kept me." You know, let me keep coming, but they did. Um, then I didn't show up for drug court um, one Friday, so they put a warrant out for my arrest. I went and turned myself in, but it was too early. The warrant wasn't active. So I'm like, cool, I'm going to go get high again. And when I did turn myself back in, I was very, very high and very, very drunk. Um, and I thought they were going to, like, maybe just release me. You know, like book me and release me, but they didn't. They um, they kept me until fr I went there on a Tuesday, July twenty fifth. My clean date is July twenty sixth, two thousand sixteen. Um, I went to drug court that Friday. Actually, they put a hold on me that Wednesday when I had court, and they said the drug court judge wanted to talk to me, and I had to stay in jail. So Friday, I thought, good, I'll be released on Friday. And this time, I had my car parked at the jail with dope and pills in it. And I'm thinking, as soon as I get out, I'm going to go take that. I am. As soon as I get let out, I'm going to take it. And I knew I'm sitting in the cell detoxing after, after, off of all this shit for all these years, detoxing with nothing. Like, no, nothing. No Benadryl, no methadone, nothing. But I was so numb, I didn't really feel anything. When I was in jail, and I was only in jail for seven days, I just remember rocking back and forth, crying a lot. I was reading this book um, that the girls, this movie we used to watch called Fried, Fried Green Tomatoes. <laughs> they had that book there, and I was reading it, and I was crying. <laughs> it was so bad. And I would like, put the book and another book on my chest while I was sleeping, because it, so it felt like there was like weight on my chest, like a child, you know, so I could sleep. It was, it was pathetic. Um, so when I got, went to drug court on Friday, Tom Clark was my, um, my drug court DHS caseworker and he was amazing, just amazing guy. Um, he had found me a place called Shepherd's Door up in Portland and it takes women and children. So if I agreed to go to Shepherd's Door while I'm still in drug court with, I can have my kids back. And, um, so I was released to, I agreed to that. And I was released to Tom Clark that following Monday. And we went and made the arrangements. <clears throat> um, and at this point, I, I wanted to get on methadone because I was still, you know, really going through really bad withdrawals and stuff. But I couldn't be on that if I was going to um, go to Shepherd's Door. No methadone or anything like that. So I quit everything cold turkey and I finally gave my first cleany cleany way to drug court like a couple weeks it took after I got out of jail um it took 30 days to go to get into Shepherd's store from the time I got released I stayed at Shepherd's store for um four months it was I just, the girls went with me um it was an amazing experience I got to talk to um the counselors up there the chaplain up there about you know everything that happened to me when I was a little girl, I got to let all that stuff go, and you know it just seems like just talking about it, like just saying it out loud, is not going to make any difference, but it does. It really does. Just saying it out loud, it made every difference in the world. You know, I was like a changed person. Um, <clears throat> we were in um, one room with a bunk bed and another bed with air conditioning. We um, I worked in the kitchen there. We had we went to church. It was a Christian um, Christian based place, um, so there was a lot of praying. But that's what we needed, you know, at that time. <clears throat> um, we got really close because there's no TV, there's no cell phones, there's no electronics. You're not allowed to have that there. So for four months we didn't have any of that, which it was really it was a great thing, you know. Um, but I decided to leave Shepherd's Door. Um, and come back to Salem, and I didn't ask drug court if I could do that. I just did it, and so when I got, when they found out that I left Shepherd's Door, 
they I went to drug court that Friday. I left Shepherd's Door on Thursday. I had the girls with me. And I thought I was going to go back to the same place that I used at. You know, I didn't know at the time that that probably wouldn't be a good idea. And drug court wasn't having it. So they didn't really arrest me, but they put me in a holding cell downstairs until they were going to figure out what to do with me. So they took the girls away from me and put them in Portland with their grandma, which is, you know, it's family, their dad's um, mom. So I was okay with that. I was willing to do whatever it took to stay clean and to be with my girls. You know, I was done. I'm, I hit my rock bottom. I, I, I couldn't go back to that life anymore. And that means, you know, not going back to people that tried to kill you, you know? So I ended up going to the Shelly house. And they told me, go to the Shelly house and stay at the Shelly house until you can get into an Oxford. And I thought, okay, I'll do it. And so I was totally complying with drug court. And it took like four months for and 14 interviews um, that I still didn't get into Oxford. Um, it's hard to get into Oxford when you have, you know, two, two children, you know, there's not always room. Um, but then I got into new options and the girls got reunited with me. I stayed at new options. I got a job. I um, stayed there for four months. Then I got my own apartment, got another job. I still have both jobs. I graduated from drug court um, this last January 5th. Um, I was in drug court for like 18 months. Um, I have a car now, I have insurance, I have my own apartment. I have both my daughters that are 11 or 10 and 12 now. And my 12 year old is on an honor roll. You know, my son, I forgot to tell you about my son. Well, when my dad died, he ended up um, going to prison a couple years. When I hit my rock bottom, so did he. He tried to kill three people. So he is in prison now for 13 years because of it. But um, he didn't kill anybody and he didn't get life. You know, and he's in the safest place for him and for everybody else right now. You know, he's doing really well in there and he will get out. And I talk to him every day. I put money on his books all the time. And he's taking it, you know, he's doing whatever he can in there to survive. And he's doing really, really well, you know. And um, even though he's locked up, the girls and myself and him, we're still like a family. You know, I call him to ask him about advice. And I, I include him when he calls about what's going on with the girls. And he talks to them. And he's like, you better listen to mom. You know, you better not do that. And, you know, and they listen to him. And Dominic's even like, Ruby, don't talk to him like that. That's your brother, you know. Because Ruby kind of is like sassy. But it's really cute. It's really important to me um, that it that he's included, you know. Um, so own apartment, own car, still got two jobs, graduated from drug court. Um, I have a sponsor, I have sponsees now. Um, I work the steps and I've come to a lot of meetings. Um, I like coming to meetings. I. I enjoy everybody um, that I see at the meetings. I consider them family. I really do. Um, and it's what's kept, kept me clean. And I don't plan on changing any of it. And that's all I got. Thank you.